Hi there folks, Michael from First Aid Oz once again. Uh, through our First Aid course or through your learning of First Aid, you will have come across the acronym uh, Doctors ABCD uh, many times I'm sure. So Doctors ABCD, again, it's just an acronym. It, it represents our emergency action plan or our step-by-step -step procedure that we use to deal with any situation requiring First Aid. Now the Doctors ABCD uh, full process um, is required in more serious uh, situations, but where the situation is fairly minor, okay, there may be an exit point along the way. So if we look at each stage of that acronym, so the first D uh, stands for danger. So when we talk about danger, we primarily mean danger to ourselves, danger to the first aiders. Okay? So there are things uh, in the environment that would be uh, obvious dangers, things like electricity and gases and fire, uh, toxic fumes and all those sort of things which would uh, be very dangerous for us. When you come to those situations, uh, usually they're attended by professionals that have the right uh, apparatus, so the right clothing, uh, the right breathing gear and so on and so forth. But as a first aider, you're not really expected to have that equipment. So you might come across a situation where it's too dangerous for you to proceed. It's not safe. Uh, the, the likelihood that you're also going to become a casualty yourself, which also doesn't help the, the casualty that's there, uh, we end up with uh, multiple fatalities in that case. So the first assessment, is it safe for me to proceed? Other things which are not as drastic as that, uh, maybe things like uh, the environment. If you're, you're on the surf coast, for example, someone's washed up on the rocks and the waves are crashing in, yeah, that's an unsafe situation. Uh, if you've got uh, an incident on the road with a pedestrian or a cyclist or a traffic incident, you know, and you run out on the road to try and help the person, the obvious danger is the traffic. Even if you're there treating the person on the side of the road and the traffic is flying past, it's a high risk uh, environment. What the emergency services uh, often do in that situation is they will close off the road or cordon off the traffic uh, to make it safe for uh, not only the casualty, but also the people trying to help and treat the casualty. Uh, and there's one that we often overlook, uh, which is risk of infection and risk of infection to ourself. Um, so again, in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of uh, information out there about COVID and, and uh, you know, a lot of people's uh, knowledge of infection is much greater than perhaps it was a couple of years ago. But infection control has always been a part of first aid for as long as we've been teaching it, and we've been going more than 15 years. But even you know, prior to that, there was always uh, the consideration of infection control. So what you need to think about in first aid, again, if you're in a situation perhaps in the workplace and you have a first aid kit accessible, or you might have first aid kit in, in the, the boot of your car or so on, is any time you're doing first aid, you need to consider putting on gloves. Okay, if you have gloves available, put them on first, first thing you do put on your rubber gloves. So this is your first barrier uh, for infection because anything you touch, particularly when it comes to bodily fluids, there you have to assume it's infectious, even if it's not. There's no way that you could know. Okay. Other things you might consider is a face shield, some, some safety goggles and so on. And again, if the person is bleeding, if you know, there's a chance the person will regurgitate or throw up or something like that, and those things can act as a barrier. When it comes to CPR, then you might look at things like face shields and masks and so on and so forth. But anyway, so risk of infection is also a barrier. So you may decide if there's a lot of blood uh, present, for example, that, and you don't have any barriers, you may make the decision it's, it's unsafe for me to proceed. Anyway, all of those, all of those uh, dangers, if you like, are also applied to the casualty. Okay, so we have a few options in that situation. So we're we determine the situation is either safe for us to proceed, so we say no, no obvious danger present, and we proceed. Okay, or we say, look, the environment is too dangerous, and we've got two choices. We either can um, remove the danger, so if it's electricity, we can cut the source of the power, uh, those type of things, or we may be able to, where possible, safely move the casualty uh, from the danger. So for example, you know, when the, when the fire brigade or the fire people go into a burning building, they don't stop in there and treat the people in the building. They, they get them out of the building first because obviously that's not a safe environment and that, that's a no-brainer. So either 
remove the danger or remove the casualty from the danger, but as safely as possible, because you need to consider they may have other injuries as well. Okay, however, if by leaving them there, they're going to perish, then we need to get them out of there. That's our, that's our top priority. And the fourth option, of course, is that there is, the danger is so extreme, there's nothing we can do. It's even, even unsafe for us to go in, even to try and move the person. In that case, all we can really do is call emergency services and observe the situation uh, while emergency services are on their way. And if it was to change in that transit period, well, then we can go back uh, to what we spoke about before. So that's dangers, okay? So danger to yourself as a, as a first aider, uh, danger to the casualty, and probably a lesser consideration is danger to others. If you've got other people there to help you, that would be great because they can help with crowd control and those sort of things, you know, because other people can also impede uh, your ability uh, to do first aid, and, and they can also be a danger as well. You often hear about paramedics getting assaulted and so on, um, and as mind-boggling as it is, they often will attend a situation perhaps where there are people who are intoxicated or under the influence of drugs or just a highly emotionally charged uh, environment, they're perhaps in shock. So other people can, uh, can pose a danger as well. So if you've got people who can control that, that would be great. Often in the workplace, you'll have a first aid station or a first aid room and you take the casualty to the room where you're able to uh, conduct uh, your first aid treatment in relatively privacy. Um, and also, the person may be, you know, if they're conscious, you know, if it's an injury where they're conscious, they may be a little bit uh, self-conscious or a little bit embarrassed. So it takes um, a bit of that uh, element out of it as well. Often we see where there's uh, paramedics attending someone in a food court, for example, you know, they'll often put up a big screen or curtain around them because, you know, there's hundreds of people trying to have a look and you know yourself when you're driving on the road when there's an accident all the traffic slows down because everybody just wants to have a look. So consider preserving the dignity of uh, the casualty as well, you know, where, where you can. Okay, so if we move on to response, uh, and this is an important stage because response it will determine um, often the degree of seriousness of the injury. So primarily we're look, looking for uh, conscious or unconscious, okay? So unconscious person generally will be lying down, they're generally on the floor or on the bed or wherever the case might be. Uh, highly unusual if the person is standing up and unconscious. Uh, however, uh, just because they're conscious uh, doesn't mean there's nothing wrong. In fact, uh, most of the first aid situations you come across, the person will be conscious, okay? They'll be conscious, but there'll be something wrong. They may be feeling uh, nauseous. They may be feeling disoriented. They may have a, a break or a fracture or a soft tissue injury. Uh, they may uh, have... have uh, an overdose or they may have be under the influence of some substance or they may have some heat stroke or you know low blood sugar there's a whole lot of things that the person may have um, through from a little splinter in your pinky finger uh, to really serious chest pain where you have perhaps the onset of a heart attack all of those things happen in a conscious state so the bulk of our first aid um, dealings is with a conscious person however there are uh, situations where the person is conscious but we regard them as having an, what we call an altered state of consciousness. So many of those examples that I gave uh, where the person has either taken too much of a substance, whether illicit or not, uh, doesn't really matter. I mean obviously some stuff is more potent than others but it does uh, pose a risk to, uh, to their health and can be potentially fatal. Um, so we would see some difference in their behaviour, some difference in their coordination, uh, maybe their ability to respond to our verbal cues or our verbal commands, um, some difference in the way they move, and all of those things uh, indicate that you know something is clearly wrong. Um, the person can have perhaps disorientation through exposure to heat, uh, particularly this time of the year in summer, we're in summer at the moment, okay, long periods of exposure to heat or uh, low blood sugar, or maybe they've forgotten to take in their medication, and, and rather than taking too much, they're just not taking it where they need to be taking it. Uh, so a lot of those things can contribute as well. So basically any time when the person is not responding in a way that they normally should, and an obvious one, a, a more common one, is uh, in the case of a knock to the head. So whether it's a fall where you hit your head, or in a sporting situation where you've been hit in the head, um, 
Um, so obviously there's uh, the high risk of concussion where effectively the brain moves in the skull, hits the, hits the, the wall, inside wall of the skull and we get some bruising of the brain. Okay, and that can be a fairly serious thing. Okay, so concussion, the person needs to be monitored for uh, 24 hours. And our initial uh, analysis or our initial diagnosis would be to ask the person questions and see whether they can respond in a fairly clear and, and uh, accurate way. So if they're a little bit uh, foggy in their response or a little bit um, answering a question which you didn't ask, for example, or giving you an answer which is nothing related to the question you asked, or their speech is slurred or, or something like that, but they're all indications that the person is, is suffering some con concussion. The other thing to consider also is the reason we monitor them uh, for so long in comparison to other first aid situations is we have a condition that we call delayed onset of concussion where the person may seem okay now, okay, but later on, um, you know, they suffer some effects and often, often it starts with headaches, really bad headaches and migraines and so on and so forth. Um, the high risk, of course, is that there hasn't been any damage to the blood vessels in the brain, okay, which the person can become unconscious um, and, and can be fatal. So we get to the third category, which is the unconscious uh, person. So the unconscious person, um, again, generally on the ground or in the bed, we, we effectively try to wake them up. So we might call out their name as we approach them. If we know their name, if we don't know their name, we just call out, you know, are you okay? Uh, can you hear me? Those type of things. Uh, make contact, a light squeeze of the shoulder, a light shake, um, you know, and if there's any response, and their responses might just be opening their eyes and looking at you. Okay, so they're conscious, but obviously something's wrong. Um, where there's no uh, response at all, and we say, okay, the person is unconscious, uh, we need to call triple uh, zero. We need to send for help. In our acronym, it's YES, so send for help. Effectively means uh, call triple zero. If I don't have a phone on me, then I call out to someone else, you know, to call triple zero if someone else is there. Um, if there's no one else there, then I need to go and do that. And, and in that case, I would need to leave the casual there until I was able to do that, okay? So it's very, very important because we need to now get the paramedics there as quickly as possible, okay? So make that, make that call. If you've got a, a smartphone, a mobile phone, uh, do it on speaker and uh, just put it on the floor, put it on the table, whatever the case might be. And you can continue and they'll coach you through as well because at this point, um, you're probably feeling a little bit distressed because the person's not responding. You don't really know what's wrong. Okay. So one thing we, we need to consider when we say doctors, A, the A stands for airway. So is there something obstructing the airway which has uh, caused the person perhaps in this case to be unconscious or even in a conscious person where they're choking, for example. Well, choking is an obstruction of the airway. So where the person is conscious, okay and there's an airway obstruction they'll often be coughing okay where they're coughing uh, we allow them to continue to cough okay but we'll look at choking specifically in a different video okay but the general basic rule of thumb is allow them to continue to cough because that means some air is still getting in there where there's no coughing um yeah that, that's a dangerous situation lips start to turn blue and so on person will often be clutching their throat we need to put them in a position where we administer the back blows and perhaps the, the, the chest thrusts to try and clear that ob object. But again, we'll talk about more, more about that in the choking video. In the case of an unconscious person, we're looking for something that's obstructed the airway. So they're on the ground, we need to get them on their back, we need to have them head back, uh, mouth open, uh, very similar to the situation you have when you commence uh, the, the breathing component of the CPR. We need to look into their mouth to see if there's something obstructing. Now, it might be anything from an object that's gone in their mouth, dentures, mouth guard, uh, and so on. Uh, people often say food, but uh, probably the more common one is their tongue. Okay, so the tongue can go down into the back of the throat. Uh, and one which is a little bit more difficult is in the case of the person who's uh, anaphylactic uh, and they get the swelling of the airways. Uh, obviously we can't manually clear that. You need the EpiPen, you need the adrenaline uh, in that situation. Um, so yeah, so we look for obstruction of the airways, we clear the obstruction. If we, if we see an obstruction and we think we can clear it, we get the person on their side, okay, and we stick our fingers in there, again we've got our gloves on, or we might have a plastic scoop that we can scoop uh, any object out, or even scoop from uh, behind the tongue to pull the tongue out. Um, not pull it out, but to, to uh, 
stop it from obstructing the airway. Uh, and also, uh, we need to consider that sometimes the blockage is fluid, particularly if the person is on their back. Uh, in many cases of people un unconscious on their back, choking on their own vomit, they regurgitate, but because they're on their back, it doesn't come out and they choke and people have died from that. Um, so again, you need to put them on their side and, and that allows uh, the fluid to, to, to drain out as well. Um, similar position when we put the person in the recovery position. So on their side, head tilted down towards the floor. All right, so let's assume that we cleared the airways or there was no airway obstruction. The next step in our doctor's A, B, C, D acronym is breathing. And again, obviously that's critical. Uh, because if we're not breathing, our heart stops. If we're not breathing and our heart stops, no oxygen going to the brain. And that's pretty much how everybody on this planet dies. The only way you can die, in fact, breathing stops, heart stops, brain gets no oxygen, game over. Okay, and a million and one ways that can happen, but effectively that's the end point for everybody. Well, obviously we don't want that to be the end point at this point, so we're trying to intervene. Okay, so we check for breathing. So we do what we say, look, listen and feel. Looking for rise and fall of the chest, it won't be you know, huge and obvious, so it'll be quite subtle. Particularly if the person is not breathing deeply, they're, they're still, so they're not running on a treadmill, they're not gonna be huffing and puffing. So place a hand on the side of the rib cage, uh, place your cheek close to their nose and mouth, so we're feeling for any airflow, and also listening for any, any air escaping the body. It might be like a slight gasping or wheezing sound. Uh, we wouldn't consider that as breathing. Um, and that's important for the purpose of the next step because if we get to the stage where the person is unconscious and they are breathing, we put them in the recovery position and then we go to our next uh, priority which is bleeding, particularly dangerous bleeding. We talk about arterial bleeding and those type of things where the blood is leaving the body quickly and, and the person can bleed out and die um, again. And we'll talk about bleeding more in our bleeding video. But that's our next uh, highest priority. Um, dangerous bleeding or, or deadly bleeding if you like um, which will fit into our acronym is so when we, we get into our uh, D at the end but we'll come to that in a moment uh, use your gloves top to toe assessment you've got your gloves on you start at the head and lightly touch because again there may be a head injury uh, and, and check your gloves regularly because the person more than likely uh, will be clothed and the clothing might be damp okay now you need to check your gloves to see whether that's blood, okay, um, or whether they've, you know, they're wet, or whether they've they've wet themselves, which can happen. All of those things can happen. Um, so so continually check your glove for any signs of pink or red uh, staining of the glove. Um, in which case, then we need to check the wound to see what what the problem is, and then we look at how we can control that. Okay, but anyway, like I said, more about that uh, when we talk about bleeding later. So the the situation where the person is unconscious and not breathing now is a completely different one okay so in the situation where they're unconscious and not breathing we need to consider um, cpr well, we need to do cpr and the other thing to consider with cpr is cpr works best when it's done in conjunction with defibrillation which we've spoken about at length in our cpr and defibrillation videos if you haven't had a look at them uh, do check those out because they're very important so in the situation, our acronym doctors A, B, C, D is slightly uh, different at the C, D uh, juncture, if you like, depending on whether the person is breathing or not. So in this case, they're not breathing. So the C is CPR, the D is defibrillation. Okay, CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation, as you probably already know. So if we are the only person there and we do have a defibrillator handy we need to go and get that defibrillator very important we get that defibrillator on the person as quickly as possible because they say for every minute there's a delay in defibrillation regardless of cpr chances of survival decrease by 10 percent okay so we need to get that defibrillator on as quickly as possible if we're not the only person if we have somebody else and there is a defibrillator uh, somewhere in the building okay we commence cpr immediately and we send the other person to get the defibrillator as quickly as possible and we continue CPR until they return and then we put the defibrillator on, uh, turn the defibrillator on and we go from there. Okay, again, check the defibrillator video and, and we'll show you what happens with that. All right, so that's the C and D for the situation where the person is unconscious and not breathing. 
when we get back to the, the unconscious and breathing, well then the C uh, will be checking circulation. Okay, in the case like we took bleeding is an example. Um, check the pulse. Uh, we don't check the pulse on the person who's not breathing anymore. Years ago we used to. Okay, but the pulse is important uh, when the person is unconscious and breathing uh, because it indicates whether the person is perhaps has an internal injury, internal uh, blood loss, the blood pressure will drop, the pulse will get weaker and slower. Um, so that's handy information to give to the paramedics when they arrive. Okay, that you've recorded the pulse, you know, you know, every every minute, every couple of minutes or so, to, to get a reading of the pulse, because that again can uh, give some indication of what the problem may be. Uh, because the person in normal situations shouldn't be unconscious. So obviously, something's wrong. Uh, an internal bleeding or internal injury will, will sometimes cause that, and and again, it can be fatal. Uh, signs to look out for there would be any any fluid or any blood leaving effectively parts of the body it shouldn't be leaving at that point in time uh, particularly blood but it can be plasma you know through the ears and so on uh, which is not necessarily red um, so they're things to look out for another reason to have your gloves because again um, we assume everybody is potentially infectious and then the d as i mentioned previously deadly bleeding or dangerous bleeding you know any d word in front of it which is going to fit the acronym which is effectively uh, arterial bleeding and um, internal bleeding or, or uh, even even a significant wound like a big wound where you can't just put a, a, a band-aid on it or put a pressure pad on it you've got to try and apply pressure to control the bleeding but this person may need uh, surgery either to, to for stitches or something uh, more serious where there's been in the case of a, of a fairly major wound almost always you're going to get arterial bleeding because the artery arterial network uh, is the whole body, so if you have you know, you know quite a deep puncture or quite a deep incision, okay, it's it's a, a fairly uh, serious injury, and the person needs hospitalisation. All right, so that's effectively your doctor's A B C D acronym. Now, you know, we talked about some pretty serious things there, like you know CPR and, and bleeding and those sort of things, but in your workplace. You know, the majority of the injuries in the workplace or the majority of first aid situations in the workplace and even to a degree at home um, are things like uh, what we call slips, trips and falls. Okay, so you might um, slip on a wet floor or you might trip over an object that's on the floor or maybe just lose your balance. Of course, those things come with their risks as well because you can fall and hit your head and then we need to consider uh, the potential head injury. But most of those situations um, create either uh, maybe a fracture or a break at worst, um, or maybe a soft tissue injury, a sprain or a strain if you're involved in anything physical. Um, again, in the workplace it might be uh, lifting an object which is too heavy or lifting something incorrectly. Uh, those sort of things are quite common which causes a sprain in the back and so forth. So again, it depends on the environment you're in. If you're in a sporting environment, you know, and you're in a collision sport, obviously there are higher risks. If you're in a workplace where you're working with machinery, there's higher risks and different types of things that will go wrong in those situations. So you need to be trained in the things that are most likely to happen in your workplace. Okay, the things that are likely to happen if you're working on the high power lines outside are different than if you're working at a computer in an office. Okay, the risks are completely different. Um, you know, so you need to be mindful as part of your risk assessment in your workplace of the sort of things that can go wrong and then be trained in those things that are likely to happen because they're the most common things you're likely to have to do. Okay, so anyway, I hope that uh, clarifies or explains the doctor's ABCD acronym. Uh, you've probably got an, an, a couple of examples of your own. Uh, by all means, uh, consider those and how they would slot into there. Okay, thank you.